Okay, uh, I will call the meeting to order. We have Five here. Four PM. Jim and Rachel. And I suspect that Brant will put their diagram I can, up. Or... I can share screens and oh, all that. Sarah, so I, I don't know who I is. I don't necessarily see. Okay, so um, Tim and Rachel, uh, your ANR application for 41 River Road is up first on our agenda. So um, perhaps what I'll do, you, uh, Sarah, I have permission to share screen? Yes, I have. Okay. What I propose to do is um, share my screen with everybody. This, this is what... This is what you all have sent us. Let me make it a little bit smaller. So it's all on one screen for the moment. Hopefully everyone can see the entire plan. Uh, oh, I see Tom has joined, great. Um, so yeah, I think what we typically do is have the applicant discuss the plan and the, the actual the proposed changes and the rationale and so forth. And then we follow with board questions and discussion. So the floor would be yours, nurses. nurses. Okay, so uh, there was one question uh, about the uh, south boundary there from the river road on the, on the Mary Nurse uh, side of the property. And that line is, is is adjusted to the last meeting where we we our proposed change to that uh, dog leg around that now all the greenhouses are on the uh, on the more northerly piece of property. The and I I'm sorry the, Tim Tim can I just interrupt because this just to make sure I'm following you properly. I'm gonna just switch what I'm displaying, which plan I'm displaying on the screen for a moment to the Mary Nurse property that we reviewed and approved at our at that last meeting. I just wanna basically, so this was the plan. Um, and I believe that this prop, this was the one of the adjusted property lines. If you can see where my mouse is moving on screen. Yes. And so we approve that. This is actually to the where the mouse is is to the north of the the line, right? So north is right. to the right on this map, as you can see, sort of sort of down there at the bottom. So this property boundary for Mary Nurse's property was previously approved for 29 River Road. And so that approved lot line in this new plan, I just want to confirm now it's the orientation has changed. So now north is where my mouse is, northish is here. So this property line, the northern property line of the nurse property is unchanged from the 29 River Road ANR. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, and in fact, even the, uh, the north-south property line for the Mary Nurse property is unchanged. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. So, so those two are existing lines. Yes, yeah. okay. Continue. So the, um, the, the purpose of adding the additional area uh, to the, to the uh, West uh, is that if we want to build additional storages, we need the percentage of, of, of rain, of drain, of, of uh, equivalent ground where the water, the, 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 the runoff yeah. uh, uh, consideration. So uh, we're planning on adding. Uh, uh additional storage so that would allow us with that additional space to build that additional storage and that's why 
that was adjusted accordingly. So, and, and I apologize, I'm still getting comfortable with reading these maps. Could, could you just help me be clear on what are the new lot lines? We've established that the boundary, uh, the Northern and Western boundary of the nurse property are unchanged in this new plan. And obviously your Southern boundary so am I correct in reading, again, if you can sort of see my mouse, that this entire plot line is new per this plan. Is that right? Um, am I reading this wrong? Actually, actually the zig, so where you are right now, going north and then slightly east and then north again, that's, that, that gets to the point where the, the line was. So previously in this whole plot plan is there's like 87 total acres that okay. goes almost all the way up to Long Plain Road. Okay. So, so because of the intention future of this, this uh, property, um, we've, we've added, we've added the additional space so we can build the additional coolers we need in the future and have the appropriate amount of runoff space or equivalent that we need to do that. Okay. So again, I'll clarify from my understanding. This, so again, starting from the Southern boundary here where my mouse is, this is an existing plot line going North. This is an existing plot line <laughs> Going easterly, this is an existing plot line. Yeah, that's and the new plot line that we're stop it, that we're stop proposing it the, today. Stop it at the dotted line. That's stop the, it at this dotted line. Is that right? No, the uh, that's four. that's the, that's oh, the here. that's the there. That's the northerly line that's already in place. I see. Okay. They're adding adding the incremental area above that to the dark line. I see. Yes. Okay. So normally the parcel would end following this dotted line. Well, currently the parcel ends there. Yeah, the parcel. But and now they're, we're, they're proposing to add that area to the north. I see. So it's this sort of um, trapezoidal piece is being added to the parcel maintaining sufficient frontage on this remaining piece. Yes. Okay. I think I understand that now. So Judy, I defer to your, um, you know, your much deeper expertise on these ANRs. Is it? Well, I was, my concern was that normally we deal with the existing lines drawn one way and the new line drawn another. So, um, so that all of the existing lines would be dotted and, and the darker line showing the new area. But um, I guess this just encompasses what the existing new lot would be. I, I'm sure that the Registry of Deeds will probably have no problem with it if, if your engineer didn't. So. so I don't have any questions. I would suggest next time you take out the deed line because that's that's become irrelevant. The the former deed line that the last day in our wiped out. Oh yeah, so and this you're you're referring to this line, Judy. Yeah, I mean because that's not that that's no longer there now, but I don't think it's going to affect the ANR or the and I wouldn't write this down, Mary. Yeah, I don't think I'm, it will affect. I'm not anything. writing that. <laughs> yeah. So there were yeah the the main question for this otherwise oddly shaped parcel is it does it meet all the other requirements of parcels actually our our concern is not whether the our concern is not whether 
what's left is a buildable lot or not as much as the fact that the ANR is, is on a public way and that these are reasonable lines. And um, I think since they own both, since the property is in one ownership and you're just uh, changing the lot line, I don't think there's any issue. So should, should we simply move to a motion to approve the ANR? So move. All right. Judy, you want to lead us through a vote? All in favor. Uh, we have our screens back. Sorry, what? Can we see each other again? I can see all three of you. But I can't. Oh. I, can, I can only see Brad. Oh, let me stop sharing. Yeah. There we there go. We um, all, in, all in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay. okay. So as usual, um, we, I'll work with, uh, so this is to you, Timothy and Rachel, I'll work with uh, our chair to get your Mylar, you know, get everything appropriately signed and available for you at town offices. It typically takes us a few days to make that happen. Um, and I will alert you by email when documents are ready for you to pick up. Is that, will that be okay? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Are, are the are the documents at town offices now? Yes. Okay. So. I dropped them off there. Yeah. So we can sign it. The the coordination part is getting done to sign the. The. Yeah. Or if since he. Or I can check whether one of check us, whether I can sign it or not, or whether yeah. one of us can sign it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we've we were able to do that bef before on one occasion per Lynn. So, okay, so so then we can just go down and sign. Anyway, we'll be in touch about um, you know we'll work out that process over the next few days. All right, thank Great. you very much for your consideration and the time you've taken. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you all. Good luck with it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I didn't print out the agenda, not realizing I'd be cheering, but I think the next thing on the map was the, on, on the agenda was the zoning map, but maybe- Yes. We can, yeah, we're here progress um, zoning map. Yes. It might be helpful to have done here, so maybe we should, Go ahead with, or would you like to? How do people feel? Would you like to talk about the zoning map, or? I guess all I can move it till later. I know that I can later. share is that um, we did ask, we did get the incorrect zoning overlay removed from the online map, so that's no longer available. And we can report that Judy updated the website at the, at the town website so that the erroneous zoning map is still available, but there's cautionary or advisory language on the page before somebody can get directly to the map. Um, but well, yeah, we had, I guess we, that, um, and I think where we stood was that. Don was going to send to Ryan Clary at FERCA the, the information for the aquifer overlay district to put on the map. And he had already done the other changes, I believe, or had the information to do the other changes. We talked last time about the fact that the water district well is no longer functioning as a public water supply and whether the zoning map should be changed to reflect that. 
And at the time I had thought that it was just a little area right around the, the well itself that was an issue. Um, I talked, Don felt it should come off. I talked to Nicholas yesterday or a couple of days ago. And he said, yes, it's no longer a public water supply. So that zoning no longer applies. Or I think his exact phrase was, we're no longer eligible for that zoning. Um, so I looked at the zoning map and the there are four zoning areas on one, two, the interim wellhead protection area and zone three. Only zone two and zone three are on the map. And I gather that that's, that was deliberate because um, the properties are owned by the, by the well managers themselves and they maintain the zoning. So it wasn't, wasn't an issue. So then in doing that, I realized that there is wording in the zoning in the aquifer protection district bylaw itself relating to the water district. And I sent you some wording on that and we could get to that when we talk about zoning bylaw changes. But Nicholas and I talked at some length this afternoon and he says that there are on the zoning map itself, there are two zone twos and two zone threes and that the the zone two and the zone three that each relate to the water district wells should be removed from the map. Hmm. And they're, they're, Let they're me just identified. share this. I'm sorry, Judy, because it's helpful. I've been looking at the map itself. So I thought I'd share, yeah. this is the map that's currently posted. Yeah, can you blow it up so you focus on the aquifer overlay district itself? Yeah. See what I can do to make this more zoom, zoom in. Yeah, so I think I can do that. Um, there is a zone that the town, the water district wells are at near where Havenville Road meets Chestnut Plain. Uh, and so the top, I don't, you have the map. Havenville. Yeah. So yeah, you say where Hayden, where Haydenville meets Chestnut Plain. So, all right. Yeah. So there's a zone two section there and a zone three, right? Close to those. Yeah. And those are what, what he says should come off. He says the, this zone two, where my, if you can sort of see my mouse, and these zone threes on either side of it, these should all be removed from the zoning map. Is that correct? The two at the the two to the north. This one I near I Bull can't Mountain. See your... no. Yeah, and I do my finger, but that's not gonna help. no, no. That's fine. Um, um, I wish I could make my mouse bigger. Well, that's okay. Um, I think if you look, it's pretty self-evident. Okay. They, but they Jenny, are, that's because the, the consolidation has made those two wellheads um, superfluous to the, the overall infrastructure now. Yeah, they no longer classified as public water supply. I thought that they might want to keep the keep the protection just in case you ever need them as backup. And I didn't raise that with with. Um, Nicholas, but I got the clear impression that this is a, a uh, mass DEP regulation more than anything. Uh, maybe you could confirm that, Tom. Yeah, um, I, I, if, it, if there's no other reason, you know, why not keep them protected, as you say, as backup in case someday we need them and they're protected? Unless yeah. there's some technical reason we should unprotect them. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, I, I think the world of Nicholas, and yet I find myself 
a little squeamish yeah, it about. Feels, it feels awful to to unprotect something. So do you want me to check with Nicholas tomorrow to see if, what, what, if there is some um, regulatory reason we have to unprotect them? Sure, that'd be great. So these are yeah. the two wells. These are the two wells that are associated with the Alice um, water. Yeah, there, there are actually three there, I think. But yeah, the two, two, yes. And you might consider talking with Wayne as well because the, the other water supply would have an emergency plan um, in place. So those wells may or may not be considered as part of that. Um, and that may be just other information you want to consider. Thank that's, you. That's Thanks great advice. Yeah. I'll check with Nicholas tomorrow. But I, I presume, Judy, you're bringing this up because since we're trying at annual town meeting to get a new zoning map voted and approved, we kind of need to figure out what aquifer protection zones ought to appear on that map. Is that right? Yeah, well, I thought if we knew that there was should be a change or we wanted a change, um, it was a great time to do it. Right. And, and it, it was also when Nicholas used that word eligible, made me think that maybe we ought to be doing it, but but that's so I think maybe we have a reason to meet next Tuesday. <laughs> next Wednesday, right? Wednesday, Wednesday, yeah. sorry. Right. Okay. All right. So we'll table this discussion to next Wednesday and also hope that. Don's there because, of course, if he's working with Ryan, he's got to know what yeah. of this zoning information to give to Ryan. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing that. Thank you, Chris. All Just, right, well, so then we I have been working on that system, so I figured I'd throw that in. You get to know this town pretty well. Yeah. So we're now into the discussion of potential zoning bylaw changes, Judy. Mm -hmm. And since Chris is here, maybe we should start with that one. Sure, great. Um, yeah, and so just a couple of points of order. Um, you know, some of the questions that we talked about last time were around sort of what's the enforcement around and and appropriate codes around some of the safety issues with certain types of uh, marijuana extraction and manufacturing. Um, and so we had met with Chris Witherall, who's one of the principals at PSI, which stands for Pressure Safety Inspectors LLC, which has become um, sort of the leading third party inspection organization in this industry. And they've done a lot, um, both they, they've done a lot with commissioning of systems and safety planning. Um, Chris himself was actually involved in writing part of the NFEPA code that, that governs these, which I'm gonna to touch on in a second. And in addition to that, does a lot of um, educational outreach to authorities having jurisdiction, everything from fire marshals to building officials to planning boards um, about some of the rules and regulations. And our intention was actually to have him here um, to, to go over uh, some of his body of knowledge, but something came up at the, at the last minute and he wasn't able to join. Um, and then additionally today, Jared, who's the main proponent of this zone change had a personal emergency, so he wasn't able to make it today. And I'm hearing that that you folks are meeting next week, so it may be uh, uh, preferable for everyone. And, and I won't speak for John, but uh, from DMCTC as well, um, if if most of this discussion waits until then. Um, but I did uh, just want to to follow up on on a handful of of things uh, while we're here that I can speak to. Um, unless uh, there was anything else that, that we wanted to do preliminarily on this topic. Sounds like a good idea to me, as much as I would like to 
keep next week's meeting short, but I guess it's a trade off this week or next week. There we go. <laughs> Um, so I guess I would just touch on a couple of things. Um, one of the things that we discussed with, with Chris and PSI uh, was sort of the way I had drafted the proposed text for the zone change, um, trying to hone in on, on hazardous processes versus not. Um, I had uh, zeroed in on that definition of classified spaces, which become required for a lot of these processes, and, and put it to Chris, is that the best standard to try to weed out the things that we would not want to see in the limited manufacturing zone? And his blunt answer was no, there's a much better uh, uh, code to point to. Um, and so um, as part of NFPA 1, which is the National Fire Code that's also been adopted by Massachusetts, the State Fire Code, there is a chapter uh, number 38, which governs specifically marijuana processing activities. Um, and that has the benefit uh, of covering not just um, hazardous materials, your uh, butane and uh, ethanol and, and these other flammable materials, but also covers non-flammable hazards, uh, the most prominent of which is uh, uh, pressurized CO2, which is often used in some of these processes, um, which is, again, a, a sort of hazardous process that we would not want to include in this uh, limited manufacturing zone. And so uh, one of the edits that I've made to sort of our proposed uh, text is to refer to um, any processes that are regulated under that chapter 38 of the fire code um, being uh, not eligible um, to occur in the limited marijuana zone, um, which then sort of has the benefit of being embedded in this code, which is uh, a national standard adopted by the state and is regularly undergoing uh, review and revision. There's another version of it coming out in a couple of years. Um, and you know, one of the things that's evolving under that chapter goes to another point of concern from last time, uh, which is sort of the verification. Uh, you know, who, who is going to be ensuring that, that things that aren't eligible to be uh, occurring in these spaces uh, actually aren't? And one of the proposals for a future version of that code is actually that there be annual inspections of uh, any of this type of equipment, uh, which then sort of provides a, an embedded means of, of someone to go check in on it. Um, and, you know, another uh, point that I think is important to note in terms of that, that verification enforcement step is that Part of the CCC licensing procedure um, of these facilities is that the applicant needs to submit their special permit um, as part of the application to show what they have permission to do. Um, and then the, the CCC is regularly making inspections of these facilities. So on the one hand, there's a document that says what's allowed to happen. And if that doesn't match with what they see is actually happening, that's a potential um, uh, spot where people can be caught. Uh, but then also significantly, because I know this board has had issues generally with enforcement of the zoning code, uh, it also creates an avenue where if the board became aware of a violation like that, you know, certainly the, the building inspectors zoning enforcement could enforce it, but that could be reported to the CCC and could uh, then potentially put the, the um, operator's license in jeopardy and shut the entire business down. Um, so, so those are points, again, uh, I hope not to be making all of these myself, which is why I sound just a little bit less prepared than usual, I think, on, on some of these topics. Um, and then uh, just real quickly, um, you know, Judy had sent uh, a couple of questions related to water, um, which I'm, I'm a little bit more qualified to, to talk about. And uh, let me just refer specifically um, to her email. And one about liquid waste and one about water. Yes, and and as I'm trying to do that, my email is stalling, uh, stalling. So I'm going to uh, speak from memory. So the first one, I think, uh, yeah, re regarded water use, um, 
And that I think is, is to me, not a huge issue, you know, just this is my opinion, uh, is not really a huge issue of concern. Um, I think a lot of people are surprised at how small most commercial and industrial users are of water as compared to residential uses. So um, as a real world example, on Three River Road, um, we are currently working on water issues uh, because of the state of the existing septic system and uh, are potentially at some point are likely to need to replace that system um, at the very least are are working with the the board of health on uh, what the what the capacity of the existing system is um, and we have done an estimate for that facility uh, which is obviously full manufacturing and the design flow for that facility is somewhere between two and three hundred gallons per day um, and for perspective, a three-bedroom house is designed for 330 gallons per day. Um, so, so sort of the the full um, uh, water use is is equal to a to a single single-family residence. Um, the the question of of you know regulating based on that number, you know, my again, my my honest opinion is it's not necessary. Um, if you did, I think it gets tricky, but not impossible to limit uh, based on water use. Um, certainly the water connection that comes from the water department, uh, you know, the size uh, that gets approved for that is generally in concert with the amount of water use. Um, and so uh, certainly I wouldn't see um, a manufacturing um, facility uh, that's using that level of water needing anything larger than sort of your typical residential size of, of a three quarter inch, one inch water connection. And if you had that serving a facility, it would just become physically impossible to use uh, uh, massive amounts of water. In addition guess, to that, um, the, the septic system gets permitted based on you know, uh, water use, um, and if excess water were being used, then you're potentially creating a situation for a failure of that system. Uh, I guess like what the triggered the question was the reference to water baths for processing. Yeah, and and so that and so that two to three hundred gallons includes uh, their intention to do that water bath processing. Uh, okay. That that process alone is about sixty gallons per day. Um, and then outside of that, it's really, you know, minimal water use. Really, it's the, the bathrooms and the hand washing that, that consume Fine. most Thank of the water you. beyond that. Um, and then on the septic side, you know, at least under current regulations, uh, the state has determined that water coming directly from the, the marijuana processing activities is classified as industrial wastewater. Uh, which sounds a little scarier than it is. There are lots and lots of processes that are defined as industrial wastewater that are relatively innocuous. But that means that anything qualified as industrial wastewater is ineligible to go to a septic system and must be captured and hauled away and uh, discharged at a wastewater treatment plant that's able to accept it and, and treat it appropriately. Thank you. That helps. Great. So is the sense for today that we're going to just table this to next Wednesday and then hear a more, and certainly it'd be great to have it all five members of the board present, because at some point we're going to have to kind of decide or vote on whether we're going to, you know, what the language might be and whether we're even going to, at this time, recommend this to the select board for consideration at an annual town meeting this year. Yeah, so I mean, from my perspective, if I was coming in under the assumption that we would be going a month and that that would have uh, concerned me, but I think, uh, you know, one week, we had anticipated that we'd be coming back next week originally. Um, so if, if you're meeting and, yeah. and willing to table the rest of this conversation till then, I think it'd probably be more productive. I and we think, however, we would have to have a pretty good idea of the precise language you're proposing or that we are agreed upon at that time because we would have to, we have to have a public hearing before 
town meeting and Brian tells me that though, I assume they picked May 23rd for the town meeting. I haven't checked, but um, Brian told me that he wants everything by May 1st, which would mean we'd have to have all of the language, which means, and I, I once tried to take amended language after we had done the warrant to town meeting and I'm never gonna mm. do that again. <laughs> it was it was not not fun. Um, so what I would we we would have to advertise the the town meeting the public hearing you know very quickly after after next week's meeting. So which yeah, means and that so, we have to have the language ready to post at the time the, the legal ad gets published. Yeah, so um, in terms of the change, uh, in terms uh, of referencing which code um, that I've already made and I'm happy to share, and you know, I, I suspect that there will be you know, some other potential changes that, that we may discuss in the meeting uh, next week, but I'm happy to send things as they are now, they're, they're largely similar to what I had circulated before the previous meeting, but um, I'm happy to share the current state of, of our language at least. I would appreciate that. I think sending it to the board, the board can't deliberate outside of the meeting, but individuals can send you questions or feedback, so. Judy, Judy, you raised some other questions about this last the last meeting. Um, could, could you remind me what, what had to do with um, access, um, other people's access to commercial properties? What, 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 oh, could you remind there are two issues. There's, there are two issues. Is this is this an appropriate use for commercial zone? And then if it is, how are the how is the bylaw? best drafted to accomplish the goals that are intended or, or what would we approve for the goals? And I opposed it on principle because I thought that the commercial zone really ought to be kept for commercial properties and not for light industrial ones. But the board as a whole agreed to go ahead and pursue discussing the bylaw to see how it how it shaped up, and I think at that point they would decide whether to go ahead with it or not. So standing a lot. So, so my objection this, 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 has nothing to do with the wording; it's to do with the usage itself. So the, we, we consider this a light industrial use that would be, by coincidence of the, the, the activities of the company, are is occurring in a commercial area. Well, the whole point of their filing the bylaw is to get the. Act to get the use in the in a commercial area, and and our you know our response, which totally understand that that Judy uh, sort of philosophically disagrees with the other uses that are allowed, but our our position is that there are other uses that are similarly light in uh, that that feel light industrial that are allowed in the commercial zone um, that that actually align pretty well with this use, and so if those are allowed. Um, to be in the commercial zone, you know, our, our argument would be that that these should be as well. But that's that's an opinion for the board, obviously. And, and maybe I'll just well, maybe before I make this comment in response to you, Chris, um, whatever you might consider, however you might describe the processes envisaged for these limited manufacturing facilities, would you say that they um, involve the use of hazardous materials? So our intention of in crafting the limited um, uh, manufacturing is to exclude processes that involve hazardous materials. That's right. And, 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 and I wanted to just ask that to put that on the record because I just want to remind the board that in our existing bylaws, under light industrial uses, there is a pretty open-ended um, um, entry in our table of use for other light industrial uses, not involving the use of hazardous materials as a principal activity, 
provided that the use will not be offensive, injurious, noxious, or hazardous. That is already in the table of use and that principal use is not allowed, no, in AR1 and AR2, but it is allowed by special permit in the commercial district, in the commercial industrial district, and also in the industrial district. So, I mean, that's even more open-ended. I mean, there, to me, that's sort of throwing the, the ball over to the ZBA to evaluate arbitrary other light industrial uses not involving the use of hazardous materials that might be proposed in the commercial district. So it's not without precedent, in my, if I'm reading our existing zoning bylaws right, to allow certain light industrial uses in the commercial district. And so I need to understand if we were to say, no, limited marijuana, limited marijuana manufacturing is proposed by DMCTC would be the kind of light industrial use that somehow we should not allow in the commercial district versus allow by special permit. That's, that's just, I just wanna make sure that context is in there. So is any of this necessary? And is it, is it, does this become a CBA issue, a special permit issue? Yeah, you know, if, if you're right, then there's no point for, for pursuing it further. Well, well, I think that since you've defined right. man marijuana manufacturing as a different use than that catch-all, then that's the we problem. would have to fall that's under it. that use and it I is see. prohibited in commercial. Well, should, yeah. we, should we be focusing on that rather than the broader issue? Well, he's, they're giving us a, a, a subset of manu marijuana manufacturing. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, yeah. As, so, if you didn't have a marijuana bylaw, then we could argue that we'd be eligible for a special permit under that that section that that Brent just did. But since there's a specific use that covers this, then then we can't go to something more general to try to to try to get qualified under. If that makes sense. So that that's why we would need a zone change in order to be eligible. So Tom, did you sort of follow that particular? piece clearly? Um, no. Uh, okay, <laughs> let me let me let me uh, let me just take a shot at it. In our existing bylaws, we right. have under light industrial uses a row for marijuana manufacturer or registered marijuana dispensary. And we have defined what those things in our existing bylaws, we've defined those terms, marijuana manufacturer and so forth. And given the existing definition of a marijuana manufacturer, what DMCTC is proposing as limited, we don't make that distinction currently. So their pro process would meet our, defin our current definition of a marijuana manufacturer. Right. So, and now the, however, in the table of use, where we've defined what where you can have a marijuana manufacturer by our current definition, we said no in AR1 and AR2. We also said no in the commercial district. Why, I don't know, but we did. And we said special permit in commercial industrial and industrial. So what, DMCTC wants to do is create a new definition, a more a narrowly, you know, sort of carve out a subclass of marijuana manufacturer. So add a new definition of a limited marijuana manufacturer to our bylaws, and then allow those also in the commercial district. I guess what I don't understand is why why doesn't our existing bylaws suffice to address the question before us as opposed to a much larger endeavor to, to change the, the bylaws? I, think, I yeah. think it's as simple as the the medical marijuana the marijuana manufacturing bylaw trumps the other one because right. it's specific. 
it carries more weight. Yeah, so the 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 use that is allowed in the commercial zone is other light industrial uses not involving the use of hazardous materials. Marijuana manufacturing is defined as a specific light industrial use, so it's not an other light industrial use, so it doesn't qualify for that use that is allowed in commercial. Yeah. Uh, okay, but it seems like we're, we're parsing pretty tightly here. Well, that's, that's I'm, yeah. unfortunately what lawyers have to do. <laughs> Put it this way, I'm pretty sure if we came to you with a proposal to do light manufacturing to do our water bath processing as an other light industrial use, um, and you approved us under a commercial, and someone appealed, they'd win. Um, yeah, and, I don't and, think and, I don't think the yeah. CBA would would approve. I it. doubt I doubt Roger would let that through. Uh, anyway, but okay, thank you. Very good. So something to look forward to for next Wednesday. When you mentioned one thing I can tell you now, um, you mentioned that the fire code requires annual inspection. Um, I would suggest you make that an explicit requirement in the bylaw overtly okay. so that it's not just so that somebody reading it understands. Yeah, yeah. that was suggest Peggy Sloan suggested that as a way to ensure that the operation continued. As as was expected after it started, and I think it would be helpful for passage to get that noted okay. specifically. And and to be clear, the current code does not require those inspections. It is something that's okay. being considered for the next version of the code. Okay, I, I don't that. want to mislead then anybody on that. Specifically, I specifically I would insert that as a requirement. Um, all right, we we will. I'm going to talk to the people who understand this stuff better than I do about that, but I hear uh, the intent of that, and and we'll look at we'll look at it. And and for the board's understanding, I talked to Brian Domina today. We have three options: we can approve it, we can disapprove it, or we can send it forward with no no recommendation uh, in any of those we would need to repair, prepare a report uh, explaining our rationale. In all three scenarios we have to whatever action we take we have to provide a written explanation. Yeah which is okay. only fair. It sure is only fair <laughs> but there's no path of least resistance where we could avoid that work. <laughs> That would create an incentive to take that. Yeah, I know. I know. Right. Yeah, we, we're up to the task. Um, I did actually, back to you, Judy, I just want to make sure, are you su still suggesting that they include in their revised language an annual inspection requirement? Yes. Okay. And would you be suggesting and I'm sorry, because I know there was wording from FERCOG related to hazardous materials, but I'm curious is the idea that they would they would be required to do an annual inspection themselves at their own cost and submit the report or something else where we would feel there would be more independence or well, something. Well, I think I don't I think that's for discussion by the board. Um yeah, if, if I can jump in, I think we'd rather go back and and talk about what's the most reasonable way to address that concern. We'll come up with our proposal. It will obviously get discussed. And if the, the board determines that different language than we come up with is appropriate, you know, then then um, I'm sure we'd uh, include that. Um, but I think but I one, one concern that Tom had last time was was how do we ensure that this stays so there are no hazardous materials? And that was yep. Peggy's suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's fair. And and some of that, and this is again something our our outside expert was going to speak to, um, is uh, and and I spoke to this a little bit last time. Is that you know the uh, the fire code 
requiring certain measures be taken to um, to protect the facility if those materials are being used. Uh, if, if you were to set up shop and start using them without going through this process, that's a really serious violation of, of a code, um, potentially up to and including a criminal violation, depending on how you did it. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, this is, this is uh, well beyond, uh, you know, the concern of someone uh, marginally exceeding their special permit permissions in a way that doesn't really violate uh, any other codes. Um, so that so that's something that that just we wanted to emphasize is between um, uh, zoning and building code and fire department and state fire marshal and cannabis control commission uh, that there are a lot of bodies with teeth that that can potentially come in with violations and even beyond that. If there were ever an incident and someone hadn't been going through the proper channels, they'd be exposing themselves to tremendous liability and potential criminal charges um, there. So, so there, there is some. Uh, obviously, anybody can willfully violate anything, but but there's there is some teeth to to some of these uh, codes that that we're referring to, and we wanted to make sure that was clear. Anything else? Oh, Thank yes. you, Chris. We'll see you next week. Great. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Stop. So, floodplain bylaw, Judy? Yeah. Um, once again, we're deferring, I guess, uh, we met. We, I'm trying to think now. Grant and me and Brian and Peggy Sloan. Is that the cast of characters? Scott Jackson Scott, met yeah. to discuss implementation and how we how we develop materials for people to understand, townspeople to understand what's involved with the bylaw and how we communicate it to voters. And the feeling was that if we had some of the like the application form and some guidance for people going through it, that that might be the best way to get information across to voters and everybody can understand it. Um, it became very clear that there's no clear guidance on this from the state um, and no, no clear examples that we, found Peggy didn't know of anyone else in in our area who who'd encountered this. I put out a request on the listserv and didn't turn up anything except a, a um, woman, the plant town planner in Irving who agreed wholeheartedly and was looking for the same sort of help. Peggy had hoped or suggested that maybe several communities could use those DLTA grants for compiling this kind of material. And so we agreed at that meeting to change our DLTA request from subdivision regulations to preparing floodplain materials as, as guidance for, for townspeople. And I sent a request to Peggy to, to do that. Uh, Brian was fine with it. It was, it was our request. It seemed like this was more urgent than the subdivision regulations without, without any question. And that's where things stand. I think um, if the, the listserv request produced a couple more documents from, from the state but nothing special. Well, there was one permit application from the North Shore somewhere, I think, um, that, that might be helpful because it outlined the steps. But we're in process, it will be ongoing and we don't need to worry about it for, for this right away, anyway. Okay. So, and it's such a kind of a big complicated thing 
that we wouldn't want to try to do this at a special town meeting, right? We'd really want to get this in front of a regular town meeting. Ideally, if, if in fact there turns out to be pressure from the state to do it sooner, we'd have to do it sooner. But that sure. works. Yeah. Right. So I think that's true with, with, with almost anything but a perfunctory zoning change. The, the select board has made it clear that those should be done at annual town meeting. Yeah, yeah, all right. And so you're comfortable that this could, you know, we're kind of setting this aside for this May, this annual town meeting, and uh, that- We don't have a prayer. Meeting. I mean, there's no way we yeah. can. Well, right. <laughs> I mean, short of an act of God. Um, but so then well, we're- you know, and to do the- Scott Jackson is being very thorough here. And he's he's the one who's based the CONCOM is the way that bylaws set up are, are the, the main review board um, where where there's where where there's no building inspector involved. And actually I think they have to look at at things even when the building inspector is allowed. And Scott is used to a wetlands work where things are very specific and where the legislation is quite tight and he hasn't had to work. He has actually clear guidelines on what he can and cannot do with agriculture, which is totally different than zoning. And so he's, he is wanting a much better feel for how he goes about this. And he's trying then we're used to, and he's trying to anticipate all the problems ahead, which is, and he apologized for being a royal pain, and he is, but he's doing the right thing. He's um, he's really trying to think it through. And I looked at, we did discover that Conway has, Conway voted a floodplain bylaw and their select, their town administrator is the administrator and I don't think they have any materials at all. Um, Cause if you look for help on their website it just lists the duties of the, of the floodplain administrator. It doesn't tell anything about what the applicant should do. And they haven't had any applications for it, fortunately. And whatever town it was that sent the permit they've had theirs has been in place for, I think they're they're in the eastern part of the state where the maps were done some time ago. Hmm. Theirs has been in place for three years and they haven't had any applications. So um, that's that's somewhat comforting to, to whoever is gonna have to administer it, but it's not much help for, yeah. for wanting to know where the pitfalls are. <laughs> so, so we're yeah, trying we're, to get our ducks in order first before we yeah. take the, the bylaw to, to I gather we have a lot of company, yeah. okay. but we don't need to worry about it now. But we're not, although we're setting it aside as a priority for this annual town meeting, there's still work ongoing and to be done with oh, a, yeah. maybe a, an intention to put this before voters in 2024. Is that right? Hopefully, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. You know as much about it as I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. Just sort of something, just making sure I, what you, you're thinking about it is the same as what I think I'm thinking about it and what everyone else knows about it. All right, so shall we um, talk about the, you know, the battery storage facilities and the aquifer overlay and the solar bylaw well, and that sort of thing. Let's do the hazardous materials because um, I got us into that and I think I'd like to get us out. Um, I had proposed amending the hazardous materials section to allow battery storage where there was adequate containment. This is the section in the table of use. And I sent the proposed language to the Conservation Commission and the Board of Health, as we had talked last time, and requested a meeting. And the Board of Health meets first, and I met with them. 
and I was explaining this and they were very, very uncomfortable about doing this um, relaxation. Um, and they got into issues like remediation if there's an incident and um, all kinds of issues. And so they, they asked me again to explain why we were doing this. And I explained about the solar exemption. And they said, well, what happens if we don't change this? And I said, well, a solar bylaw person would come and say that this is unduly restrictive and threaten to take us to court. And we talked about it and we agreed that at that point we would probably have to grant or we would probably not go to court because the court case was pretty straightforward that this would be a problem, but probably the ZBA would have to grant a variance. And especially since we presumably the bylaw is written so that the hazardous materials are contained. And they felt that this was infinitely preferable course of action than to weaken the hazardous materials bylaw. And the more I thought about it, the more I agreed with them. So I think we do run a risk of a solar bylaw developer saying, look, you can't, if somebody raises the hazardous materials issue, they would say the solar exemption doesn't allow this to happen. And I think they would be right and probably it would all go away. But we would have to talk to the CBA about that or they would and town mm -hmm. council would probably be involved. But I'm pretty sure town council would say that the solar exemption overrides the hazardous materials. And I, the more I thought about it, I thought that was the better course of events. Is Just there a to, need to let the ZBA know the outcome of this conversation since this could- I don't think they knew that this- I don't think so. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody else is comfortable. I don't think anybody, I was the, I was the proponent and I think if I, but make sure everybody's comfortable with this. So the status quo stands. Yeah. 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 And we should be aware that that provision probably does file, does run afoul of this solar exemption as defined on, as the recent court case was worded, but I'm sure that solar developer will point that out to us. We don't remember. But, but what I find a little interesting about that still, and I admit to be a novice in this, is that we were just having a conversation around manuf marijuana manufacturing, where, um, you know, I think we kind of got the idea that if DMCTC, as an example, tried to get one of their limited marijuana manufacturing facilities through in the commercial zone by saying, well, it's not a marijuana manufacturer, it's this other light industrial use. Well, that would ultimately not fly because the definition of marijuana manufacturing in the bylaw would trump and that they, they, they couldn't do it. And it seemed like we were thinking, since we've defined large-scale ground-mounted solar facilities and so forth, and we have a bylaw provision for those, that it would seem like this, there would be that similar legal reasoning, right? Like, could it really be the case that somebody could challenge so a solar facility by saying, well, no, 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 you said you were a solar facility and that's allowed in the bylaw, but this other thing says, like, again, I'm, I'm struck by the, it seems like the logic goes in two different directions in those two different scenarios and that confuses. Well, me. I think they're two different things. Uh, the first one is a more, is a definite, it's the precise use. It's still ma marijuana manufacturing. Okay. And you, you can't get around that. Right. Um, the other one is, is talking more about the materials that might be involved or some other aspect of the operation rather than the use itself. I see. So I think you're, 
it's I would make an analogy to a height limitation or a um, or a setback. I, it happens that both the hazardous materials is in the table of use, but it's it's sort of a generic thing, not specifically use, not not as precisely tied to the marijuana manufacturing use. Okay. All right. But but we now better understand what the possible future scenarios are and we're prepared yeah. to it may well them. be it I suspect it may well be that nobody will ever raise that as an issue if there's a yeah. nobody okay. has previously so okay all right um so there were these two other related things there was the some revisions that we were considering to the existing solar bylaw to deal with um, hazardous materials and including some changes suggested by FERCOG. Um, and then there was a proposed prohibition, addition of a prohibition regarding battery storage in the aquifer overlay districts. And I, I think what I'd like to do is have a discussion first now about the proposed prohibition in the aquifer overlay district bylaw, because I think that will affect our thinking about changes, related changes in the solar bylaw. How do you feel about proceeding in that way, Judy? Well, I was going to suggest the other way around because we didn't ask for the the changes from FERCOG. They they were volunteered, and I gather you've been doing. I mean, I know you've been doing a great deal of research on on um, battery storage in general, and probably next year we'll have a proposal for for a standalone battery storage bylaw. And I would suggest that any revisions we make to the solar one ought to be compatible with that. So maybe we should just table FERCOG's suggestions for now. Yeah, should I, would Sarah and Tom like to hear a couple of minutes on what I think I've learned about battery storage, and I, I, I want to take pains to say that while I've been looking into battery storage, it really wasn't through the lens of standalone battery storage, though I've learned a lot about that particular mode. I was really looking at it through the lens of battery storage as part of large-scale ground-mounted solar um, facilities, and I was kind of overwhelmed with what I've learned so far and my conclusion you is shared that yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say you shared a great deal with us. So I, I um, but I yeah, second, I have... yeah, I second that. Your clarification of the definitions grant was very helpful. And it cl by clarifying those definitions cleans up and makes it much easier reading of the bylaw. So thank you for that. Thank you, though I'm not sure I'm, Honestly, <laughs> I've been doing too much in too short a time, and I did circulate a proposal to all of you. Though interestingly, I'm now contemplating just dropping that um, because of these other things that I've learned since I wrote and circulated that proposal, like in the last few short days. And what I summarize it as is um, I have found exactly one example from the uh, city or town of Medway where they, uh, they first put a one year moratorium on battery storage projects in or out of solar facilities while they could hire a consultant and do studies and you know, they really went through a whole process to understand batteries as you know, just 
the kind of residential things you might find like, like I have in my basement or that a business might install or that might be part of a big solar field. So they put a lot of time and energy and money into that. And they finally just November of 2022, they made a, did a big revision to their bylaw that covers battery storage in all of its forms. And I can't tell you tonight that I have fully absorbed <laughs> all of that, except to conclude that there are many different kinds of battery chemistries. There, apparently they've concluded that differing battery capacities given different chemistries pose different levels of risk. And I don't understand what's behind that yet. And what started is, you know, I thought Judy had this great idea, like, okay, we want to protect our aquifers. She had originally asked me, how could we, instead of just adding a prohibition for commercial battery storage systems, what could we write in there that would be appropriate? And I, like, I feel like I ha have been hit with a fire hose of information. I don't think I have a good answer. And I'm really afraid because, you know, if we put the wrong language in this prohibition it, within the aquifer protection district, my understanding is that if, like when I had a, you know, I have a battery system, I have solar plus storage in my house and the installer had to pull a building permit to get that battery installed in my house. And I would be concerned that if we put the wrong kind of prohibition in the aquifer overlay district, suddenly uh, one of our neighbors who wants to install a battery with their solar array would not be able to get a building permit because now we've just blanket prohibited batteries of all kinds. And I, I'm sorry if I'm rambling a little bit. I just I, I'm I'm struggling to find a nice. Oh, we we the approach was to limit by size. Yeah. So that, so that hopefully we we allowed the kind of thing you're talking about, which is residential use, and so that's why we had, you know, I think what I took, I think of something like 20 kilowatts or something like that uh, as a potential cutoff. And with the idea that this would be, you know, really for, for individuals to use. Right. And that makes a lot of sense just intuitively, but I'm just gonna screen share something for all of you. I just wanna show you just a teeny little piece of the approved Medway bylaw. So I've got it on my screen now. Let me just share it with all of you to just hopefully this will help make my point here. Okay. All right. So they have this language in their bylaw to say that basically batteries with these different chemistries and they, these different capacities are, you know, anything below those thresholds, this is key language. Anything that does not meet those thresholds are not subject to the bylaw and are allowed by right in all zoning districts. So they, however they did, and I don't know what their concerns are about aquifer protection, there's so much I, I do not yet know about what, how they arrived at these chemistries and limits and so forth. But, you know, lead acid, 70 kilowatt hours. Nickel, 30 kilowatt hours for lithium ion. They said all of these, they say are, okay, you can install batteries below these thresholds by right anywhere in Medway. And then down below, they discriminated two different tiers of battery storage systems above those thresholds. 
So they did a tier one saying, well, if it's got an aggregate energy capacity less than or equal to one megawatt, and tier one, they basically allow it almost everywhere by right in Medway. So there's almost like two levels that they've researched and said, these are basically okay. The ones they really are concerned with are what they define as these tier two greater than one megawatt. But can I say that we would be okay if we just said, hey, anything above one megawatt, not in the aquifer protection district? I'm just not sure I know enough to feel comfortable with that. I well, mean, well, Brent, who, who helped them put this together? They, uh, four or five good citizens sitting around a table. And no, no, they hired a consultant. They this got is a very consultant. highly technical stuff. And um, and we need to tap into that, you know, find the funding if we don't have it, to get someone to help us sit down with us yeah. and help us interpret our concerns and what what can be applied to address those concerns. I mean, this- well, let me this just suggest, hold on, hold on. They hired a consultant. I, I have yet to reach out to Medway, but I'm confident that the consultant produced a report and, presentation materials, and I wouldn't be surprised if Medway would be willing to share those with us. So we may not have to reinvent that particular wheel, but I, I have not yet gotten access to those materials. I, I was actually flabbergasted when I saw what they had done. And the, the project that was proposed for just a plain road as part of the solar thing was one and a half megawatts. And it had six banks of batteries that were taking up a, an area, I think it was about two tractor trailers in size. And it generated an enormous amount of opposition. And I can, I can just about guarantee that there wouldn't be a prayer of getting anything like this through in Whateley. And personally, I'm not sure there should be, but, but that's, I, I really don't know how much we wanna spend discussing this now. I think that there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of technical stuff to be done. I'm not quite sure why you object to limiting the aquifer storage, aquifer overlay district to just residential storage though. That's, that's the part that. Well, I think what I'm saying is that I don't, based on all of that, everything I've come across, I'm not convinced that that's not overly restrictive. Like, I don't know that, um, I don't know how I would define residential battery storage. And I think just putting residential battery storage in literally those words in the bylaw as a prohibition could have serious unintended consequences on my neighbors. And I, you know, banning something and, you know, where people couldn't get a building per permit and couldn't do things that could very well be reasonable, but we just didn't do enough of our homework to know that, I have a, that's what I have a problem with. Okay, well, maybe we should just skip this for now too and not go ahead with that one. That's where I was leaning, but I didn't want, I'm not advocating that we drop it. Um, I'm just saying that we kind of hit a, hit a, artery of information here. One, one thing that I think those of you who weren't privy to the solar bylaw fight, um, one of the arguments that was made, I think quite convincingly was that these uh, lithium batteries and especially the lithium ion batteries are a relatively new technology and nobody is sure about 
about the long-term behavior of them and especially since they're toxic about long-term maintenance of facilities and all. And there was a great emphasis on when we did the solar bylaw revision on inspections to make sure that that things were still sound and that the containment facilities were still adequate and that kind of thing. And one concern I have with something that's by right is that there's no way to require me there's no way to require maintenance or inspections or um, that things are maintained the way they're supposed to be. And I guess the example here, and it has nothing to do with batteries, but before we moved in West to West to Waitley, we lived in Weston in a house that was built in the 20s. And somebody had put on a little addition to the kitchen and they had cut through a bearing beam. And the bearing beam was required by code, but they just went ahead and cut through it. And, and the contractor we had um, said, you guys are really lucky to be alive. You know, you could have been under this when it collapsed. And you never quite know what, what, especially individuals or businesses, how, the, how they maintain things. So that's, that's one of my concerns about these. So, okay, I think it's just too, too confusing a subject. We should just table all of the battery storage stuff until, until next, well, until after town meeting anyway, keep working on it. So I think we should still look at what we want to allow and prohibit within the aquifer protection district. And I think, you know, again, not for this town meeting, but we should be working on, and I think there are these other improvements that could be made to our solar bylaw that again, I wouldn't propose that we do by this annual town meeting. What, I, what impressed me was that what I saw with Medway is that they have a, zol a solar bylaw. They, they, they have solar and they have a storage bylaw that kind of work together. And it could be, you know, Judy may be right. I get the idea that people are afraid of things that they don't understand. And people may be well, just- they, they believe they understand it. Well, yes, I mean, people are afraid. <laughs> that's right. People are afraid of things they believe they understand. There also, were, the world does there change. Were a number of, there were a number of technical papers by experts talking about explosions and fires and uh, the and ramifications of that. So it wasn't it wasn't just- There have, there have been some major fires at these facilities. And, and, and then the question put forward, which was very sobering, was our fire department prepared to deal with this kind of situation? And there was a lot of silence around that and the answer to that. So I, it wasn't it wasn't just boogeymen under under the I, I don't I get it. i really and really I'm not trying to cast aspersions on you know my neighbors of of that era, but I also would just gently point out. <laughs> Technology changes at an incredibly fast rate, and there's lots of motivation for manufacturers to, you know, when there are fires um, and explosions and things, to, um, you know, find ways of preventing it. Like just think about when I was growing up in the '70s, how many airplanes, airplane crashes were happening. And now I can't even remember the last time a commercial airliner, you know, in our country crashed. They made safety improvements, they made technological improvements. So anyway, um, I'm with Judy that we just table all of this for now and keep discussing it. And it may be that we will end up making some surgical changes to the solar bylaw, because I do feel strongly that the, the language in the existing solar bylaw as it pertains to battery storage is, is kind of a, a mess. And again, I don't mean to, it was, it was probably as well, well done you know, as it was. You, you talked about it change over time. It's interesting to me that when we drafted that, FERCOG was no help at all. 
and or I shouldn't say that, but they they didn't have any specific knowledge to help us. Yeah. And clearly now they do because she was she was able to tighten up our bylaw quite a bit. Yeah. And so things are moving along and learning is happening. Right. You know, it's interesting, by the way, on that point, again, you keep triggering me to go do some interesting research, Judy. Um, I looked around at surrounding towns and, you know, of course, Hatfield, as one example, doesn't even mention battery storage. Williamsburg basically copied our entire solar bylaw. <laughs> but there's, it's, it's also interesting still, this day and age, how few by towns I can find out there that even have a solar bylaw. So we're still, you know, well down the road. Yeah, it's those pioneers that get the arrow in their backs too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see. So where are we in terms of everything? Um, we do know though, for this annual town meeting, we definitely need to fix the garbled language in the solar bylaw. So we still need to open the lid on the solar bylaw and fix. This is the thing about underground utilities. Does everyone remember that? Yeah. Okay. So we definitely have to make plans and maybe with next week. And, we can and I would like to suggest that we, no matter what we do with the, with the zoning map for the, for the aquifer protection district, I suggest that we remove the references to the water district that are in the bylaw itself. That was the first document I sent out today. Okay. That's just that's just straight housekeeping, I think. Okay. So we'll so we do the uh, I've just been keeping my own little running tally of things that we might put before the voters. So we think we'll do a zoning map, we'll fix the garbled language in the solar bylaw. We'll do this new new revision. And we, I get that well, we should assuming that the people agree with me, but I, yeah. I it's you know it's just taking out the water district and leaving the water department. It's basically what it's doing. Should we we you can have you can have a week to review it and think about okay. it. Okay. All right. So we'll put that on the agenda for discussion next week. Okay. Um so we're dropping for annual town meeting this thing about hazardous materials, the non-residential use issue. Um, we're, dr we're not dropping, tabling. Tabling the revision to the Act of Core Protection Bylaw regarding battery storage. We're tabling for now the revision to the solar bylaw as it pertains to hazardous materials around batteries, the same reason. And we're, it's an open question at this point, whether this limited marijuana manufacturing proposal will um, get on there. And we're tabling for now the new floodplain bylaw. So there's somewhere in the range of three or four planning board acts of mischief that may appear before town meeting. Yeah, but they're by and large, what I would call housekeeping or cleanup yeah. or nothing, nothing earth shattering. Well, you know, maybe with the exception of the limited marijuana manufacturing, right? Because anything involving yeah. Yeah. marijuana could touch a touch yep. an earth. Yep, that's. Okay, okay. All right, that all feels good. All right, I'm good with that. Um, so we're not, so I guess we're done with potential zoning bylaw changes for tonight. Mm -hmm. And we're not approving any minutes because there are no minutes to approve. And I don't know. Do you have the we... request from Brian for volunteers? I do. It's I, that's that's 35 to me. Yeah, that is an additional item that was not anticipated. Give me one second to... Uh, he is, okay. they have, <laughs> I believe received a grant and 
and hired Berkshire Design to facilitate a study about how best to um, work on or what can be done to make the area around exit 35 a um, robust or as robust as possible a, a commercial district, I think, or a um, economic district. I shouldn't define the type of activity. And they're looking for two volunteers from the planning board. And we are charged to come up with them. And we're not leaving <laughs> until that's done. Uh, I'm going to plead with my colleagues to, that I won't be one of these volunteers, just to gently remind people that I'm, I've been on the Capital Improvement Planning Committee and I am a regular attendee on the Franklin Regional Planning Board. Yeah. So those are my additional, my extracurricular. Oh, and uh, an ad hoc solar committee. Could two other people take this, please? I have to be honest with you, I can't take it on either. This is a significant study and it's gonna take a significant amount of uh, off, offline work. And I'm, I'm, I, I don't know if everybody knows, but my term is up in uh, June. So it wouldn't be appropriate for me to sit on this anyway and then walk out the door in, in two don't, months. Don't leave us, Tom. <laughs> Is that a way of like letting us know that you're not going to re up? Right, right, right. At, at the moment, that's where, where I'm headed. I've got three very young grandchildren. That we're going to be traveling a lot. Um, I've got some great writing projects, and <laughs> and and it, I just can't take on any more extracurriculars. So I'm sitting at do, doing what I've been doing. I can. I can <laughs> It's taken me 30 years to get to some projects I'm just starting. So, but I also don't want to be a slacker. I know everybody's pulling pulling more than their their share, and and you need someone who can uh, step up and do do more extracurricular things. Other other otherwise, well, nobody tells my husband I'll volunteer for this. Why do, I am, need, why do they need two planning board people? Yeah. Because we're Sarah, in the high functioning area really well. I am you know past capacity in my life now, and I just took on another volunteer thing because it's more of oh, my, yeah, you're, my real alley. And you're, I'm you're, you're, yeah, I'm taking still taking on a big job at the history of the prior position. I don't. Have any capacity? Well, let's see if they'll do it with one, or maybe Don will be willing to sit on. All right. Well, maybe we can. I don't know if you set an uh, immediate deadline, but uh, hmm, hmm. Well, they have to take what they get, I guess. It's they don't have because... the power of conscription. Yay for that. Okay. This all right. is our all our volunteer time. I mean, it's anyway. So maybe Judy might just ask Don specifically if he would join you on this. I hope he's okay. Yeah. Um, you didn't hear from him. Nope. That's no reason to think that he's not okay. But well, this is I might have forgotten that that it was um, a week early. Yeah. That, it's that, hard to if you read your emails, though. Well, that's another topic. OK. All right. So since Brian actually addressed the email to you, Judy, <laughs> I'll leave it to really? you. Really? I didn't even notice that. <laughs> I'm merely, you know, the rest of us are merely CC'd. So. We will I will trust place our trust in you to follow up with Brian and Don as appropriate on this. You're his favorite anyway, Judy. 
Bryant. Are you, are you Brian's favorite? He picked you. <laughs> the kiss of death. <laughs> so perhaps, are there any other unanticipated items other or a call to a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. I'll second that. I don't think we need to take a roll call vote. Despite right. Oh, and I'll just confirm. So we're going to meet next Wednesday at our usual time. I'll let Amy know that. Keep that on the calendar. We're going to do DMCTC. We're and I guess the zoning map, right? The zoning map. And boy, if we could get a copy, at least of what's been done so far. So we could look at it. Yeah, that would be good. You know. And I will take the action to try to follow up with Don. Another occasion, make sure all is well with him to get those um, the A and R materials from Nurse signed. And I'll reach out to all of you as needed if additional signatures are needed. I think all we need are like three. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. The town hall closed on Fridays. Yes. Okay, then I can only sign on a Wednesday. Only sign on a Wednesday. Okay. I'm only available anywhere near Waitley during their business hours on a Wednesday. Oh, but they're open later one evening, right? On like Do Monday? That. Yeah, the assessors are there Tuesday nights. Okay, I could do it when and they're done. Don has a key, I think. Or yeah, Don has a key. Don is a key, and I know Tom stepped up recently to, to swing by and sign. So. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can do that. Okay. Don can't sign this one, can he? Um, it, it may, he, I don't I'll, think I'll he check can. again. I forget the details. I think. I don't think he can sign the ANR, whether he can sign the, whether we can attest that we approved it and he can sign it as chair on our, but it would be a lot easier if one of us could. Yeah, and so I'll definitely be able to do it. It's not that far from where I live. And um, and I'll check again with Amy and, and the retired Lynn Sibley um, about the exact, I think there was something she told me to write on an AMR like, so that I could sign as the chair, but anyway. Well, I did, the a and <laughs> itself and the mile, I, I'm sorry, the. The plans in the Mylar don't require the chair. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. But, well, I'll, but I'll what, the, what the forum requires, I don't, <coughs> I don't think the registry is really going to care, but the town clerk should. All right. So we'll see you next we, week. All right. It's been fun, as always. Have a good night, all. See you next good week. Night, everybody.